accusations. She said Meghan was selfish, somebody who wasn't suitable to be a royal, and a shallow social climber. Bust-ups. And every family keeps quiet about where their skeletons are. This family hasn't. They've brought their skeletons out and they've dragged them through the streets. And an increasingly bitter feud. She owes this family respect just because she's suddenly a duchess doesn't mean that all of that is eroded and, and isn't important anymore. After the dream romance, the nightmare fallout. What's happened is a commoner has married into the royal family and it's created fireworks. I've got to say, this has probably been the biggest circus that I've ever come across. Now, with a new royal baby on the way, can Meghan and her family make up? The baby has a grandfather who he or she is in danger of never meeting. And if there's any chance of reconciliation there, I think all parties should be trying to grasp it. Hi, Mr. Thomas. Will Harry finally get to meet his father-in-law? For them not to have met each other seems quite absurd. And after all the rows, insults and embarrassments, can the Windsors ever be friends with the Markles? At the time, I know that they were kind of tearing their hair out. What on earth do we do with this family? If it's embarrassing to the British royal family, it's more embarrassing to us. May 19th, 2018, and the world's media descend on Windsor for the UK's biggest social event of the year. The marriage of Prince Harry to American actress Meghan Markle. It attracted VIPs from around the world a-list celebrities, and generations of royals from the Queen downwards. But among the 600 guests in the chapel, just one member of Meghan's family was present, her mother. You know, once you've gotten over the shock of seeing Oprah and the Cloonies and the Beckhams and all the, the star-studded guests, you then realise that actually it was pretty extraordinary that there was one solitary figure in that front pew, and that was Doria. My heart just swelled for her. I just thought, what an incredible woman you are. But I also felt very, very sad for her, and I thought it was just extraordinary that there was no other family member there. I found it just, yeah, unfathomable. Megan herself arrived alone. She must have been nervous inside. I mean, we're all nervous, but what was incredible was how she managed to cover up those nerves, how she managed to conduct herself, hold herself. She managed to smile. She managed to look quite coy and bride-like. But I think we realised the image she was putting forward. And then halfway down, she was met by the Prince of Wales. And it was a very kind and touching gesture. It was, it was very theatrical doing it that way. I don't think Charles filled in in any sense in the emotional support. I think it was more of a practical walking up the aisle. Someone had to walk her up the aisle. He was doing something, stepping into a situation where it should have been her father. Thomas Markle blamed his absence from his daughter's wedding on serious heart problems. He's since recovered, but their relationship has not. I think as far as Meghan is concerned, it was unforgivable that her father wasn't at her wedding day. And I think that's probably why the relationship is as unhinged as it is now, because it really did drive a wedge. There's clearly a very, very deep rift there. This relationship is, is, is you know, a bad one at the moment and obviously needs to be patched up. How's she feeling? This is a man who's ground down with hurt and uh, who doesn't really know where to turn. All I, all I can say is that uh, I'm here, she knows it, uh, and I've reached out to her and I need her to reach back to me. It's a gaping wound in the marriage of Meghan and, and Harry, and it's a wound that I believe they should try and heal at some point in, in the very near future. Uh, I love her very much. The public split between father and daughter was as quick as it was surprising. Ever since achieving fame, Meghan had gone out of her way to praise her upbringing in Los Angeles. You know, at the end of the day, I'm really just proud of who I am and where I come from. She had a very happy childhood. Both of her parents were very committed to her, to them as a family unit, and so she herself paints a picture of a pretty happy childhood. And actually, if you talk to members of Meghan's family, they will tell you that...
Doria and Thomas did everything they possibly could to support their daughter. I think our dad was very integral in her imagination, her development. He was very funny and creative. They were very, very close. I would say, you know, not more so than her mom was, but in different ways, maternal and paternal ways. But my dad has a fantastic sense of humor, so he could easily make her laugh and get involved in stories and playtime in a very theatrical way. I mean, I won't say she didn't have it in herself naturally, but I think it's largely my dad who encouraged her to explore creativity and being an actress. As well as offering his advice and encouragement, Thomas Markle's and lighting director in Hollywood. And following a win on the state lottery, he ensured his youngest daughter had the best education possible. Megan went to some of the most expensive schools on the planet. She went to the Little Red Schoolhouse, which was uh, attended by all kinds of celebrities like Johnny Depp's kids. She went to Immaculate Heart, a Catholic school, again, quite an expensive school. And then finally, she ended up at Northwestern University, one of the most expensive colleges in America, if not the world. It's something like $70,000 a year to go there. Meg was fast-tracked from being in really good schools. My dad was happy to be able to give her that in her life, to give her that advantage, and, um, and so proud of it. And I felt that that was special of him, and he never wanted anything back. He just wanted to see her blossom. After graduating from college, Megan began a new role as a struggling Hollywood actress. For almost a decade, she auditioned for bit parts in movies, ads, and game shows. Until getting her big break in the TV legal drama Suits, her mother and father had backed her throughout it all. Let's not forget that Megan, for 10 years of her budding career as an actress, was something of a failure. And, and you know, she was kind of at 30, over the hill, just about, in Hollywood terms, when she got this gig in Suits. But the fact that she kept on going on, the fact that she went to all these uh, rehearsals and auditions uh, and uh, without the prospect of work um, showed, you know, the, that kind of determination that her father had imbued in her and that has propelled her uh, to where she is today. By 2016, Meghan was an international star with a TV series screened around the world, an army of fans, hundreds of thousands of followers on social media accounts and her own successful lifestyle website. In June that year, to celebrate Father's Day, she posted a touching tribute to her dad on social media. In it, she thanked him for everything he had done for her. But two and a half years on, such messages are a thing of the past. Coming up, how her acceptance into the Windsors sparked a war with the Markles. Prince Harry revealed that it had been a wonderful Christmas and that it had been a chance for Meghan to be with a big family. It's the, it's the family that I suppose she's never had. I remember listening to that comment and thinking, oh, you're going to ruffle some feathers here. That really lit the blue touch paper as far as the rest of my uh, Markle background. Los Angeles. When Meghan was born here in 1981, she was Tom and Dory only child but there were others around too Thomas Markle he had two children from his previous marriage uh, Thomas Jr uh, and Yvonne who later became known as Samantha they lived with their mother to start with after they got divorced and uh, he'd moved to uh, to California and later on they went to live with him and then of course when he got married to Doria uh, they became Megan's uh, half brother and half sister and at first they all seemed to get on very well and they, they mixed very well and got on well with the neighbors and uh, he had all sorts of parties at home where friends would come around and they all mixed extremely well we were a pretty normal family. Meg was born at the hospital and brought home to our house. We did teach her how to walk. We did carry her around on our shoulders, watch her throw peas all over the kitchen and get blueberries everywhere and, you know, all of the things that babies do and watched her grow. Although all three Markle children got along, there was one significant barrier. When Megan was born, Tom Jr. was 15 and her sister Samantha, 17. 
We were as close as we could be for, for our ages. But were we pals? Did we hang out? No, because I wanted her to have her friends and peer-specific interactions for her development. It wouldn't have been appropriate for the oldest sister to be hanging out. Her friends would have looked at her and said, uh, could you lose the big sister? Can we just <laughs> have girl time? So it, it, it was as natural as it could be age appropriately. By the time Megan reached adulthood, she, Samantha, and Tom Jr. were living separate lives, talking to each other only occasionally, if at all. In her 40s, Samantha was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and, following a career in broadcasting, became a mature student. The completion of her degree provided the opportunity for a reunion, a touching moment captured in this rare photo of the sisters together. The last time uh, Megan saw uh, Samantha was at Samantha's graduation when she went to university. That was in 2008, so that's 10 years ago. They had sporadic telephone conversation. Tom Jr. went his own way. And by and large, the family just broke up. The Markles may have stopped functioning as a family unit, but their memories of happy, earlier days with Meghan remain strong. In 2011, they saw her achieve the acting fame she'd always craved. In 2016, they heard rumors she was dating Prince Harry. And in 2017, they watched as the two announced their engagement. It was just an amazing surprise. It was so sweet. I wasn't surprised. I thought, you know, Meg's beautiful. She's young. She could date any musician, any actor. She wants anybody. In fact, I could barely let you finish proposing. I was yeah. like, can I say yes now? She didn't even let me finish. She said, can I say yes now? Can I say yes now? And then, then there was hugs, and I had the ring in my finger. And I was like, can I, can I give you the ring? And she was oh, yes, the ring. <laughs> so to me, it's like, let's see where it goes. And good for her. If he's a good person, if he loves her, if this is right, let's see where it goes. At the end of that year, Meghan spent her first Christmas at Sandringham as a guest of the Queen. Days later, Harry went on national radio. Prince Harry revealed that it had been a wonderful Christmas and that it had been a chance for Meghan to be with a big family. Were there family traditions you had to explain to her? Oh, plenty. I think that's probably... I, mean, I think we've got one of the biggest families that I know of and every family is, uh, is, is complex as well. So, no, look, she, she's, she's done an absolutely amazing job just you know, right. getting in there and, it's, you know, it's, 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 the, it's the family that she, I suppose she's never had the family that she'd never had. Now, I remember listening to that comment and thinking, oh, you're going to ruffle some feathers here. Well, that really lit the blue touch paper as far as Samantha, Tom and the rest of them were concerned because they felt that she had had a family. She was trying to ghost the Markles of her life and they felt real resentment that here was this woman trying to deny uh, her Markle background. The first thing I thought was, I don't think Carrie's been given the full story. Something's not right. Although we weren't the classic large family together on schedule, on ceremony at every holiday, we were family. That's all we could think. And then, and then the question was, why? Like, why would you be embarrassed about your family? Why would you need to, you know, set the stage differently? I was starting to feel like, uh, she's not reaching out to family. But could this have been prompted by Samantha herself? Shortly after the engagement announcement, she had made a string of disparaging comments to the media about Meghan. Megan! She referred to her sister as a social climber. She described her as narcissistic, said that she'd always wanted to marry a prince, and she had a thing for gingers. Well, the last two, not too negative, I suppose. But, you know, narcissistic and social climbing just doesn't paint a very positive picture. Neither did her comments about the rumoured $75,000 cost of the dress Meghan wore in her engagement photo shoot. Samantha claimed it was excessive, given Meghan's high-profile campaigns to lift children out of poverty in the developing world. Critics accused Samantha of being jealous of her younger sister's success and wealth. Money is always one of the big issues that causes family feuds. If you and the other, less successful brothers and sisters thinking that as their family they should support them during hard times. Samantha always resented the fact that, that Meghan didn't pay back to her father the money that, that he'd given for her education at Northwestern, which was like $70,000 a year. And that, remember, he's been bankrupt, Doria's been bankrupt, Tom Jr's been 
bankrupt. Samantha has been bankrupt. So the finances were always an issue inside the Markle family. Nobody ever asked her for financial support. As a principal, you would think, yes, your father's getting older, your sister's in a wheelchair. You, you could have offered. We wouldn't ask. But I know if someone wanted something from me, I would give the shirt off my back. So maybe I assumed too much thinking she would have the same sort of graciousness. But at that point, it wasn't even about us. Here she is on the stage holding hands with children in countries where people are incredibly poverty stricken and who don't have clean water. And to spend so much on a dress just felt like gross overindulgence. In the midst of this criticism, Meghan had a wedding to plan, but the guest list was causing more family friction. It's a problem that all families face. Who is going to be invited and who is not going to be invited? And those that are not invited nearly always feel extremely hurt and annoyed. And the person that's doing the inviting says, there's no way I'm having them at my wedding. With the wedding just weeks away, Meghan and Harry still hadn't revealed their list. By April 2018, Samantha could wait no longer. On social media, she expressed how excited she was at the prospect of being invited. It's, it's fascinating, really. You examine that period and the run-up to the wedding, there was this period where they all felt that they were going to get an invitation and they could all go, and then the invitations didn't come out, and that is when the dam of venom really burst. I think out of tradition and respect, everybody in the family felt that they should have been included because the eyes of the world were on the family, and therefore, if you weren't invited, it must have been because of some fault of your own, or you must be awful and not worthy. So the whole family was feeling like it is a public statement. It is a public exclusion. And then we saw strangers invited, it was celebrities whom she didn't even know, and people from the public. That was a slap in the face. It's like, wow, we're not even considered in all of that. And, and we were still trying to rationalize, like, oh, well, let's just respect her. No, no, it's not about just respect her. She should just respect us. These are real people with real feelings. Was quick to respond to the very public snub by way of an open letter to Prince Harry. He claimed the upcoming wedding was the biggest mistake in royal history and even urged Prince Harry to call it off. I thought it was a bit below the belt, and uh, I'm sure he probably regrets doing it, but uh, at that stage, he probably thought he had nothing to lose. He wasn't going to get an invite, so again, it was, it was a question of embarrassing Meghan, and I think that's probably the reason he did it. Although Tom Jr. soon apologised for his letter, Samantha went on the attack. As she once again took to social media, observers were divided on whether Meghan had made the right decision. I don't think uh, Samantha Markle could seriously have been expected an invite to the wedding after what she'd done with her tweets. And clearly, Meghan made a decision fairly early on not to invite her. And if she's not inviting her, it was very difficult then to invite her half-brother. Uh, so I think it was, it was a non-starter. I've always felt that, quite fr that if Meghan had sent invitations to, to uh, Samantha and Tom Jr., we would not be sitting here today. She should have just said, come to my wedding <laughs> and here's a couple of seats at the back shut up and sign a, sign a non-disclosure agreement. They would have uh, been very happy to be very quiet and enjoyed the day. Thomas, do you wish to comment about the fact that they saying that... One family member who was supposed to be there was Meghan's father. After a successful TV career, Thomas Markle was living in quiet retirement in Mexico. His daughter's wedding was less than a month away. But to the surprise of many, she still hadn't introduced him to her future husband. He's talked to my dad a few times, hasn't been able to meet him just yet. They announced their engagement in November. They didn't get married until May, so there was plenty of time for the two of them who'd busied their diaries, you know, going around the country in the UK and doing a mini tour, which is brilliant to go and meet the people of Great Britain. Fantastic. But also go and meet your father-in-law. Hi, Mr. Thomas. How are you? According to friends of Meghan, she did offer her father support, but he refused it. Now the media interest was growing, along with the pressure. No one from the palace had told him what to do, or even told him what to expect. He was then stalked by the paparazzi, and there were some very unflattering photographs of him in the media, looking very overweight and very untidy, carrying cartons of beer, and just looking shambolic. And he was very hurt by this. I mean, every time 
opened his door, there, there were camera crews there, and he didn't really know what to do. But then, photos of a smarter, better groomed Thomas Markle appeared in the press. They showed him apparently being measured up for a new suit, searching for news about the wedding on the internet, and reading a book about famous British landmarks. I'm just having a look at photographer for more than 20 years. It's just so obvious that all these pictures are set up. Nobody reads a book like that. And the book is beautifully positioned at a 90 degree angle so you can crystal clear see what it says, author's name, the whole lot. This is Mr. Markle in an internet cafe looking at Harry and his daughter on the internet. This computer is facing at an angle that way, but it's strategically turned this way because the photographer wants to get what's on the screen. And also, which is even more ridiculous on this, the photographer is actually in the internet cafe. This is Meghan Markle's dad being fitted for a tuxedo for Harry and Meghan's wedding, allegedly. If this picture wasn't set up, the photographer was very, very lucky because that's the sort of picture that you would get when you go to a model and say, stand there for me and I'll take a picture. Full frontal, full direction, looking straight at the cameraman. It's just a comedy of errors, this setup of pictures. It soon emerged that the photos were staged. Thomas Markle had been working in league with a photo agency, which then reportedly sold them around the world for a six-figure sum. I mean, it was hugely embarrassing for everyone involved. The whole episode would have infuriated Prince Harry. He probably was sympathetic to, to Thomas, you know, on reflection. But for his father-in-law to be engaging with the paparazzo, the paparazzo who he blamed for the death of his mother, who Harry detests, it, it was just the worst thing that Thomas Markle could have done. And, you know, the couple called Thomas afterwards. According to Thomas, um, he hung the phone up on Prince Harry because Prince Harry berated him and said, if he hadn't spoken to the press, none of this would have happened. I think Harry said that was very stupid, wasn't it? Um, and I think he felt a complete idiot and he felt a fool and he felt humiliated. And that was sort of the beginning of the end. Meghan's sister, Samantha, has since admitted organizing the photo shoot. She says Thomas Markle received $1,500 for his cooperation, and claims she wasn't motivated by money, but by a wish to improve her father's disheveled media image. I would defend it to this day. I think what the mistake was, was perhaps that, excuse me, the British royal family or that Meghan Harry would not have defended my father, Meg knowing that that's not how he is. They could have come out and said, don't beat up Thomas Markle. Don't do this to him. And Meg should have defended him. And because she didn't, I was, I was, Fuming. This is not right. You have so much power in the position you're in. Speak up. Don't let him be run over by a train, like stand there and do nothing. So I, I thought, no, I'll take control of this. I'll make sure that he's photographed properly. And if the world doesn't like it, that's not my problem. I'm not going to let them destroy my dad. Eight hours later, Thomas Markle said he wouldn't be attending the wedding. He claimed to have suffered a heart attack and was unfit to travel. The royal only found out when it appeared on the American celebrity website, TMZ. It was like a bomb dropping. That was not the way it should have been happening at all. So I think, you know, the palace lost their grasp on the narrative. Yeah, there's no doubt that the palace, Kensington Palace, completely lost control of the situation. That's the one thing they don't like. And Prince Harry is a bit of a control freak himself. And he would have hated the fact that they did lose control. And he lost control as well. As Kensington Palace called on the media to show respect and understanding to Meghan's father, the couple were once again criticised for not visiting him. I definitely think they should have gone to see him promptly. Could they have postponed the wedding? Maybe not, but I would think that after the wedding that Meg and Harry would have gone to the hospital at a minimal and then taken him to Buckingham Palace after he recovered. But, you know, she didn't show up. Those close to Meghan have since said that she and Harry tried to bring her father to London for the wedding, even after the stay photos were published. Once she heard about the heart attack, they say she called and texted him constantly, but he failed to respond. Thomas Markle's absence meant there would be just one member of Meghan's family at St George's Chapel, Windsor, for her fairy tale marriage to a British prince. Next, once the wedding was out of the way, how this speech reopened the family wounds. My earnings from a job on campus went directly towards my tuition. I saw that, and the first thing I thought was, oh,
My God, what did she just say? Tradition is at the heart of the royal family. And for hundreds of years, choosing a partner was no exception. In previous centuries, royals always married royals. So they would look for a suitable princess from a European house. And it's really only in this century that the royal family have married out, if you like, and married what we call commoners. <laughs> The ability to marry outside the Blue Blood ranks has given the royals the same freedom as others, but also the same problems. And in recent times, none have been as problematic as the Markles. According to Meghan's friends, she was not close to half-sister Samantha or half-brother Tom Jr., and neither were a part of her life before she met Harry. The problem for Meghan has been that the Markles aren't prepared to cut her loose the way that she has cut them loose. And unfortunately for Meghan, they show no signs of going away. Most focus social media posts and media interviews, often in exchange for money. Let's face it, you know, we all have to survive. Money makes the world go round. So if you want to call that cashing in, that's fine. But no one in media would refuse a check for talking about the royals. Samantha now has the status of a, an official pest. From the word go, she's been very critical of Meghan. Meghan's half-brother, Tom Jr., has also given a string of interviews, but not all his media appearances have been by choice. Tom Markle Jr. is a bit of a lost soul, to be honest with you. He's been married before to Tracy Dooley. He's got two children, but he doesn't have contact with his sons, certainly doesn't have contact with Tracy, and is in a fairly tumultuous relationship with a girl called Darlene. Tom's problem is that he lives in Grants Pass, Oregon, which is a small town, and he goes to the local bars and drinks one beer too many. And I think he's ended up in county jail a couple of times. There have been all kinds of fights, usually when drink has been taken. It is not the behavior that you would expect of uh, uh, someone who is uh, related now to the Queen. While some family members have struggled with the media spotlight, others have tried turn it to their advantage. They include Meghan's nephew, Tyler, son of Tom Jr. You know, he runs a marijuana farm out in America. He's cashing in on it in any way he can. My name is Tyler Dooley. Back in the States, I live on a farm. I cultivate marijuana. You know, his product is called the Markle Sparkle. The family are cashing in both on their notoriety and becoming more notorious. Despite the absence an invitation to the royal wedding, Tyler still made his way to London for the big day. Other family members, including mum Tracy Dooley and his brother, also made the transatlantic trip. That must have been really embarrassing. It just turned the whole thing into a farce. I've got to say, this is probably the biggest circus that I've ever come across. They didn't manage to, to spoil or infringe on Meghan and Harry's day, but, you know, there were salacious headlines nonetheless involving Tyler rocking up at a nightclub and not being allowed in because he was carrying a knife. You know, again, these sort of negative headlines that just seem to be part of the Markle debacle and just will not leave Meghan alone. And you couldn't make it up. For Meghan's sister, media coverage of the impromptu visit by a few relatives led to the entire family being tarred unfairly. They were fringe family members taking advantage of a situation. I, I, they had never interacted in any of our family events or come to holidays or Thanksgiving or gone to Doria's house or her mom. They weren't part of the, the family. So, you know, it's all of a sudden there's this, we're close. You know, we're, no, we're not. We've never been. Despite the controversy that surrounded her big day, Meghan managed to put the stresses behind her. At one point, the whole wedding was becoming in danger of being the Markle show, a kind of a, a great, grotesque pantomime where this family just made fools of themselves and made fools of the royal family and especially made a fool of Meghan. And yet, all that kind of evaporated the moment you saw Meghan make her way on her own in St George's Chapel. It was all relevant to what we'd all invested in, the union of a prince with a young woman from nowhere who was going to become a duchess. With the wedding and honeymoon over, Meghan began her new life as the duchess.
of Sussex. In October 2018, she and Harry made their first official trip, a 16-day tour of Australia and the South Pacific Islands. We saw them traveling the globe, intense timetable and schedule that they were sticking to, more walkabouts that were considered a triumph as far as Meghan was concerned, showing her warmth, showing her popularity, and then, of course, the baby announcement. It went through the roof, and we had Meghan Mania Mark II. For a while at least, Meghan's family troubles seemed behind her. But then, a speech to students on the island of Fiji reignited it. As a university graduate, I know the personal feeling of pride and excitement that comes with attending university. She wrote her own speeches, and one of which was on education. And she talked about how she got grants, she'd worked uh, herself in order to pay the fees to go to college. It was through scholarships, financial aid programs, and work study, where my earnings from a job on campus went directly towards my tuition, that I was able to attend university. Not one mention, of course, about her father, who had also stumped up a considerable amount of cash to send her to university. And without question, it was worth every effort. I saw that, and the first thing I thought was, oh, my God, what did she just say? Samantha gave uh, Megan it with all barrels when it came to the fact that her father uh, was not mentioned in this speech. In a series of tweets, Samantha attacked Megan and her speech. She said any money she earned during college would have been for parties and shoes rather than tuition. I do think that Samantha Markle has got a point, but she's just so unpleasant. I don't see why she feels she's gaining ground by being so unpleasant and telling us things that possibly are true, but we don't really need to know them. The bottom line is, because you're prestigious, you can't get away with just treating people how you want. And, and there's no, nobody can tell me through university graduation, not a check missed, his signature on all of them, every second of the way was because of my dad. And that she knowingly, now this is, you know, there's no senility involved. This is not a memory lapse. This was blatant disregard and um, disrespect and, and cruelty. Unbelievable. As 2018 drew to a close, relations between Megan and her family seemed to have hit rock bottom, but they were about to deteriorate further. Coming up, Samantha responds for the first time to the letter that's plunged the Markles into fresh crisis. Broken heart? She doesn't have a heart. Ever since Meghan's engagement, there's been no let-up in the feud that's engulfed her own family. Along with the attacks from her half-sister and brother, her father has given a series of damaging interviews. He was quite scathing about the royal family. He said they were like the Stepford Wives. He said they were like a cult. And he said they were a bit like a Monty Python sketch. And uh, he said that the Queen would meet Donald Trump and yet uh, Harry wouldn't meet him. So he clearly was getting quite hurt. And he is deeply hurt. And uh, those sort of comments, of course, uh, you know, come from the heart. But uh, they're not going to help the relationship. Thomas Markle later apologised for his comments and went on TV with an emotional appeal to his daughter. What is your message to her and to Prince Harry? If they're watching. Well, I love you very much. You're my daughter, and I'd really like to hear from you. I just keep asking uh, to re respond back to me. Um, and I haven't got any response back. But as a group of Meghan's friends claimed in February 2019, she had responded in a letter she sent six months earlier. We saw revealing private correspondence between Meghan and her father. She had written to him a letter saying, you know, please, can we move on? Can you stop victimising me? And, you know, stop going to the press and so on, which, of course, we know he's got form for doing. Thomas Markle has since gone to the press again, this time to reveal extracts of the five-page letter. In it, Meghan said she did support him financially. She also accused him of exploiting her relationship with Harry and of fabricating stories. He branded the letter as hateful. That letter was strategic. It was so elegantly written and contrived. She was basically saying that, you know, my dad had been a liar, that I was a liar. Meghan claimed that Thomas hadn't reached out to her in any way since the wedding. He has text messages on his phone galore. 
she was not contacting him. So it doesn't matter what her letter says. Megan criticized Thomas for reading the tabloid stories about her and believing what she branded as lies. She claimed many of these lies were manufactured by Samantha, who she said she barely knows. There are a lifespan of pictures and experiences together, so maybe it's convenient for her that in her mind she doesn't know us because she doesn't want to because she wants center stage as being a self-made woman. She accused her father of doing nothing as Samantha spread false stories about her. I wasn't maliciously lying. I was pointing out what the world was already seeing. I pointed out that humanitarians don't treat their father coldly. Was that a lie? No, because the world watched it happen to my dad and the world watched her do it. Megan's friends dispute this, saying she personifies elegance, grace, and philanthropy. She claimed her father's behavior had left her with a broken heart. She doesn't have a heart or she would have been doing everything she could to make him comfortable and reciprocate and be loving and gracious and make sure he's comfortable in his old age. So broken heart? No, his heart's broken. She can't turn herself into the victim here. When contacted about the content of this program and the statements made by Samantha Markle, Kensington Palace declined to provide a comment. The continuing feud within Meghan's family is potentially damaging to her new one. Along with the other members of the so-called Fab Four, she's come to represent the modern face of the royals. They have an image to protect, an image guarded by one woman in particular. The Queen has seen her own fair share of scandals within her own family. So the whole situation with the Markles is, is not going to have her sort of turning away in disgust, but it's not the image the royal family want to have. And she realizes that it does have the potential to negatively impact on the couple. And what's not to say that Thomas won't turn up at an official engagement? If that's the only way he feels he's gonna be able to get through to his daughter, if he's well enough to do it, it's something he might well consider doing. You know, and that's when it's going to cause potential embarrassment for the royal family. And the Queen will not want any more embarrassment when it comes to the Markles. With all due respect, you know, I can't say how she sees things or, or whether or not she feels she should intervene, but she certainly is the matriarch of Great Britain and of the British royal family. She might want Harry to handle this on his own, being the man, and he should. Um, because if it's embarrassing to the British royal family, it's more embarrassing to us. If the Queen can't bring peace to the warring Markles, the arrival of Meghan and Harry's first child just might. When a family has a new baby, it's, you want your baby to know their grandparents. So even if you are a stranger, you don't get on with your parents, that is the moment when you know that that grandparent, grandchild relationship ought to be given a chance to thrive. Prince Charles has developed a close bond with his three grandchildren. With the fourth due in April, it'll be Meghan's decision whether to allow another grandfather into his or her life. The baby has a grandfather who he or she is in danger of never meeting. And if there's any chance of reconciliation there, I think all parties should be trying to grasp it. While family feuds are nothing new, none have been as public as this one. With the eyes of the world on her and her family, will Meghan ever be able to mend her relationship with her father? If she doesn't reach out to her father when she's had her baby, that relationship will never be repaired, will never resume. Under a sensible scenario, Meghan would have the, her first child. At some point, her father would come and see the baby, see Meghan and for the first time meet Harry and then go on his merry way back to Mexico. That's the sensible solution. But as we've discussed, there's nothing sensible about the House of Markle when it meets the House of Windsor.